Hi, everyone. So this is the part two of distance approach. Um, so I don't know like how many people came new to this part two, but we discussed about the basic distance approach in part one. And we will discuss about some advanced version of distance approach in this part two. So if there are any questions regarding the presentation itself or like the previous presentation, please feel free to ask after um, all presentations by me. So I'll just start the presentation now. So this presentation also goes with the contents like in the slide and we'll see the concepts and details of Pearson correlation approach, which is one of the um, advanced method in distance approach. And we will talk about some differences to basic approach and possible improvements as well. So once again, I'm Juhan Ko and I'm research apprentice at Hassan Thames and I'm also a senior at Yonsei University. So before we start, this presentation closely follows a paper um, mentioned in the screen and the other papers I uh, followed is in the reference part and the very end of the presentation. So let's see the key concepts of Pearson correlation approach first. As the name implies, it applies Pearson correlation on return level for identifying pairs. So take a look at the um, equation in the slide. D is return divergence and beta is the regression coefficient of stock I monthly return on each co-mover return, which is denoted as RJ. And RF is risk-free rate. So even though the variables are not clear yet, I'll go deeper later in the presentation, so you don't have to worry now. And by using the equation here, we sort stocks in descending order based on their previous months uh, return divergence. After sorting, a portfolio is constructed for trading. So this was just a basic overview of the Pearson correlation approach. And now let's look at the portfolio formation part where we build portfolios based on the method. So there are three steps in portfolio formation, data pre-processing, pairs formation, I mean pairs portfolio formation and trading signal generation. In data pre-processing, where we pre-process the input data in order to scale different prices, series of stocks, then we form pairs portfolio based on the concept I introduced in the previous slide. After the pairs are formed, we generate the trading signals. So this is how it goes. The flow of pairs trading in this Pearson correlation approach is same as the basic distance approach I um, introduced in the distance approach part one, the previous session but there are some details where they improved some limitations of it. So I'm pretty sure you'll like it. Okay, let's take a look at the data pre-processing first. So first, um, we need to split the input data. The step, this step is needed in order to split the pairs portfolio formation period and trading period. So according to the papers, which introduced this Pearson correlation approach, they usually use from year T minus four to year T for pairs portfolio formation and T plus one for trading. That being said, five years of data is needed for pairs portfolio formation and one year of data for trading, but any length of data can be used for trading too. And after the data is split, we have to slightly manipulate the data in order to move on to the next step. As the method has to compute all of the pairs correlation values in the following steps, for M stocks, there are M times M minus one divided by two correlations to be computed in the formation period. And as the number of observations for the correlations grows exponentially with the number of stocks, this estimation is computationally intensive. Therefore, most of the researchers uses monthly data, stock return data, to reduce the computation burden in the formation period. But um, this can be dismissed if you're okay with the computation burden and if you wanna see the daily price movements, but using monthly return as an input may reduce some unnecessary noises to the model. So it's your go. Here, we'll stick to the monthly return data as an input. Okay, the next step is pairs portfolio formation. In this step, first we have to find pairs for each stock 
So we find n stocks with the highest Pearson correlation to the stock. And after the pairs are selected for each of the stock, pairs portfolio formation needs to be done. And this portfolio is not the portfolio we will trade in the end, but it is like a benchmark portfolio for each of the stock. So it means that the portfolio of those N stocks only serves as a benchmark for portfolio sorting in the following steps. So you can choose either an equal weighted portfolio or correlation weighted portfolio. The equal weighted portfolio, as you may assume, use average returns of the top end pairs of stocks for each stock and the correlation weighted portfolio use correlation coefficients as weights instead of equal weighting. There are like some pros and cons of each weighting method. So you may test either one of them. Okay, here's an example of a pair with a high Pearson correlation coefficient. As you can see the plot on the right side, the return of two stocks are moving in the same direction. Um, after we form pairs portfolios for all stocks, we will calculate the beta. Um, this, the beta is calculated as the equation in the slide by using linear regression, setting stock return as an independent, as an independent, uh, as, a, as an independent variable and, oh, sorry, as an independent variable and pairs portfolio return as, an, as a dependent variable. The method set beta as a regression coefficient. And here is an example of stocks with high and low beta. The plot on the left side is a stock with high beta and the plot on the right side is a stock with low beta. Okay, so the final step in the portfolio formation is trading signal generation. So with all the information we have from the previous step, we first calculate the return divergence. So this is the equation um, I showed you in the key concept slide. So pairwise trading hypothesis here is that if any given month in year T plus one, which is the trading year, a stock's return deviates from, so if the stock's return deviates from its pair's portfolio returns, then in the following month, this divergence should be reversed. So this is the like uh, base hypothesis in this approach. So the return divergence are calculated with the beta created in the formation period like this. And after we calculate the return divergence, we have to find trading signals based on that. So all stocks are sorted in descending order based on their previous month return divergence. And if the percentages of long and short stocks are given, let's say like P percent and Q percent, the top P percent of the sorted stocks are chosen for long stocks and the bottom Q percent of the storage stocks are chosen for the short stocks. So according to the work by Chen in 2012, a dollar neutral portfolio can be constructed by loaning decile 10 and shorting decile one and held for one month. So now let's move on to the differences to basic approach as I already introduced the Pearson correlation approach. So now let's see like what is the difference. So the difference can be summarized by these two, less stricter, less strict than um, SSD minimization and higher information level contained in a diversified co-mover portfolio. First, this Pearson correlation approach is less stricter than SSD minimization. Okay, to show what this means, we first have to understand the variance of return spread and the variance of price spread. As the Pearson correlation uses return of stock data and constraint for high return correlation between stocks, it leads to lower variance of spread returns as the equation shows here. However, the returns of the individual assets may still exhibit different variances. Therefore, we are not restricting to the stocks that have low variance in its return series, which is equal to possibly more opportunities of pairs trading. In contrast, when we use the basic distance approach, it can be described by the variance of price spread as it uses price series data. And for simplicity, we assume that minimizing SSD 
leads to a minimization of price spread variance. So the variance of the spread price um, reaches its minimum of zero if the two stock prices are perfectly correlated and their price time series exhibit exactly the same variance. That means that if the minimum SSD is the only criteria in pair selection, it forms pairs of assets with similar variance and high correlation, which is much more <clears throat> stricter than the condition of Pearson correlation method. And there's a high chance that the resulted output of the basic distance approach might bring some less profitable portfolios. Next is higher information level contained in a diversified homover portfolio. So return divergence um, from such a portfolio are more likely to be caused by idiosyncratic movements of stock and thus potentially reversible. So actually, Perlin tested in 2007 and 2009 the advantages of quasi-multivariate pairs trading versus univariate pairs trading. As the Pearson correlation method uses pairs portfolio as a co-mover benchmark for each of the stock, is quasi-multivariate pairs trading results in higher and more robust annual excess returns than univariate pairs trading for a broad range of different threshold values. Um, however, this method, this Pearson correlation method, still has some limitations and has some space for improvements as well. So although it uses Pearson correlation, the two assets correlated on return level do not necessarily share an equilibrium relationship. And there is no theoretical foundation that divergence um, need to be reversed. However, I think it can be addressed and tested with some like factor market hypothesis, I think. And one of better approaches may be to look for co-integrated pairs or adding co-integration tests in pairs formation period, which I mentioned uh, during the Q&A session. So, and there is also co-integration module in the ARB lab as well. So you may check it out if you want. Okay, so it took a bit shorter than expected. And here's the references of the slide. So please um, take a look at the papers uh, from this slide. And <clears throat> as this is the end of the presentation for distance approach part two, before we move on to my third presentation, which is the hedge ratio estimation method, let's have a quick Q&A session again. So is there any questions regarding the distance, distance approach part one or part two?